Wow, we're there. The final segment of the Brand Bewitchery series right here on the Business of Story. I'm Park Howell, and today you will travel the hero's journey story structure as I use it to frame my origin story. As you know by now, Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, or what they also call the monomyth, is the inspiration for my story cycle system. The best way to show you how it works is in the telling of this tale so you'll know how to use it in your own storytelling. So come along for the ride. I'm so glad you're here because I kind of want to put you to the test. As you listen to my origin story, see if you can spot ABTs in the wild. Count how many times I use the five primal elements of a short story to make a big impact through an anecdote. And notice how these two story structures advance the narrative forward through the scaffolding of the hero's journey. And then, at the end, I'll detail how the story cycle system is a simpler version of the monomyth that I map to business communications so that you can easily use it to grow your business, create more brand awareness for your company, excite your people, and even advance your career. What do you say? Shall we begin? Brand Bewitchery Appendix 2. My Origin Story. Quote, follow your bliss and the universe will open doors for you where there were only walls. End quote. Joseph Campbell. In the preface, I asked you if you found this guidebook, or did it find you? The same question can be asked of me in my work with The Hero's Journey and my story cycle system. Here's how it found me while I was looking for an answer to one big question. How do we connect in our over-communicated world? And I'll even retrace my odyssey using the 12 steps of The Hero's Journey. Welcome to my not-so-ordinary world. The haunting apparition appeared before me out of nowhere. I was careening down the Searing Farm Road in my 1984 Honda Civic, its gold paint having long ago been burned off to a dull brown. The air conditioner suffered from chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which wasn't cool because it was 112 degrees that July afternoon in 1993. Maybe I was hallucinating. Heat waves radiated from the blacktop, creating an opaque landscape of gray gravel, green cotton fields, and the white hot sun. And then, like something conjured by Stephen King, the thing materialized in the oncoming lane. I leaned over my steering wheel, squinting as the distance between us closed. I muttered, what the? I was returning from Buckeye, Arizona, a farming community about 30 miles southwest of Phoenix. I had spent the morning there with one of the largest advertising clients for the small ad agency where I worked, Schult Homes. They make manufactured houses. That's where my young, illustrious ad career had taken me to a distant planet about as far from Madison Avenue as one could venture, selling mobile homes. Following my meeting, I had grabbed lunch at a sad-looking pizza hut. I sat resigned over my single slice of pepperoni. It was all the $1.75 in my pocket could afford. My right elbow was on the table as I propped my forehead on my hand and looked past my smudged glass of water into the baking parking lot at my stupid little car. My career can't get any worse than this, I thought. Rock bottom in Buckeye. A quarter, dime, and two pennies sat next to my crumpled napkin. I got up, went out to the heat, and crawled back into my smoldering car. Broke and broken. I tapped the pedal and squealed out of that parking lot, throwing a little defiant gravel in my wake. Now I was racing down that road as if I were running away from my cruel predicament. What the hell is that? Through the shimmering heat wave, I saw a grotesque silhouette coming toward me. The phantom snapped into view. 
It was a fully dressed, rainbow wigged clown pumping his big old clown shoes on the pedals of a red Stingray bike, balloons trailing behind him. As I raced by in disbelief, he turned at me and smiled those yellow teeth old clowns flash behind their crusty white makeup. My eyes darted down to the side mirror, then up to my rear view mirror. I wasn't seeing things. A clown was pedaling out of sight into nowhere. I flumped back into my driver's seat. A smile surfaced at the realization my mobile home meeting and measly lunch weren't rock bottom after all. This chance encounter with my freewheeling Harlequin was the universe's way of having one more chuckle at my expense, as if to say, stop taking yourself so damn seriously, clown. A Call to Adventure Two weeks later, a headhunter appeared out of nowhere. I had toiled in the advertising industry for eight years, working for small public relations firms and ad agencies in Phoenix. My wife, Michelle, and I were raising two kids with a third on the way on a $26,000 salary, a pittance even in the early 1990s. At one point earlier that year, I told a friend that I was going to venture out on my own and start my own ad agency. He looked at me over lunch and cautioned, you're not ready yet. Ugh, that hurt. My career felt like it was in a death spiral, but even now I'm overselling it because to be in a death spiral implies that it had actually taken off. I was an impatient advertising wannabe fascinated by building brands, but my own brand wasn't defined well enough to land me a gig at the big prestigious firms. At the five-person Peterson Communications Agency where I worked, I did everything. Concocted marketing strategies, wrote copy, managed clients, planned and bought media, produced radio commercials, organized special events, and pitched news stories. I got to play attorney, too. When the savings and loan crisis of 1991 took down several of our real estate clients, sticking our little agency with their media bills, I was the guy the process servers served court papers to from angry media outlets that wanted to get paid. The first time I got served was 7.30 in the morning as we backed out of the driveway with our kids in the car going to Sunday Mass. Now that was an awakening. Perhaps my most profound lesson came one day in an innocuous car ride back to the office. Sandy Peterson, the agency owner, and I had just met with our client Warren Hess, founder of Robinette Roofing. Yep, mobile homes and roofing contractors, a golden client list. Sandy asked me what I learned from the meeting. I fumbled for an answer. That's your problem, he scolded. You don't listen. You were so busy trying to be impressive that you didn't hear a thing Warren said. Gah! I knew he was right. I stumbled into the rabbit trap that snares every young, ambitious, and insecure professional, trying to sound smart when you don't know shit. But that was only one of my challenges. While I was learning tons about the various aspects of the business, I had no focused personal brand. Potential employers said, I'm not sure where to put you. Or, you're not really a creative because you've done all of this account service stuff. One clearly myopic creative director dismissed my portfolio of work and told me I didn't have the creative chops to be in the advertising business. Well, I could smell a fraud from 10 paces and didn't give his critique much purchase. As I was turned down time and time again for jobs that I thought I wanted, the biggest lesson I would learn about branding was staring me right in the face, but I couldn't see it. Only later did I realize that the best brands know who they are, what they do differently, and therefore better than anyone else, and what they actually stand for. I didn't know it at the time, but I had to clarify my story to amplify my impact and ultimately simplify my life. And that's when my guardian angel headhunted me. Refusal of the Call Michelle and I had just returned from Rob and Carolyn Malinowski's wedding. I had worked as an intern for Rob in the Fury Group public relations firm in Seattle in 1983 while finishing my communications degree at Washington State University. Rob and I became fast friends. 
While standing at the altar as a groomsman, I remember being happy for them, but remorseful about my job. I hear you, pretty self-centered. So while Rob and Carolyn were saying their I do's, I took advantage of the spiritual setting and put it out there to whomever might be listening above. Is my career going anywhere? Or is it time to find something else? Send me an answer, will ya? Returning to Phoenix, I walked into my office Monday morning and found a pink message note from the previous Thursday with a name and number on it. Bill Frankemont. Hmm. Bill Frankemont. Probably just another media rep, I thought. I almost tossed the note because I wasn't up for another sales call or a trek into the unproductive unknown. But then something nudged me. It had been nearly five days since he called. Perhaps I was missing something. So I picked up the phone and dialed. Meeting of the Mentor. A proper sounding receptionist answered, DHL International, may I help you? Hmm, potentially a new client call, I thought. Uh, yes, Bill Frankemont, please. Who may I say is calling? Park Howell, uh, returning his call? Of course, one moment, please. That was weird. She sounded like she anticipated my call. Before I could give it much more thought, someone picked up the line. Hi, Park, this is Bill Frankemont. His friendly and determined demeanor struck me immediately. Good afternoon, Mr. Frankmont. I see you called. Yes, Park. I am an executive recruiter, and I have a fast-growing client that is in need of an in-house director of creative services to manage their new product branding and marketing campaigns. Silence. Park, you still there? Bill asked. Um, yes. Uh, what does this have to do with me? Being recruited was clearly out of my wheelhouse. Well, I've talked to a number of people, and I think you might be a good fit for the job. I'd like to arrange an interview, he said. Really? When? Tomorrow. Tomorrow? They're moving fast, Bill continued, and they will fill the position by next week. Next week? I wasn't exactly the picture of confidence on our first call. Perhaps you can come in at lunchtime, given your current employment situation, he suggested. Tomorrow? Yes, Park. Tomorrow. Uh... Okay. Bill sprang from his desk with a big smile and a firm handshake as he welcomed me to his office. We had a quick and cordial interview, but I was still a bit dumbfounded by this turn of good luck. So I asked Bill how he had found me. Well, I searched the Phoenix Business Journal book of lists, he said. I found that Peterson Communications is ranked 25th among the top 25 ad agencies in Arizona, and I noticed that you are listed as a principal within the firm. Yeah, I thought to myself, yep, and I learned that the glamour of being a corporate principal means you're also personally liable for all of those damn media bills, too. Bill continued, I've had great success placing young executives from the book of lists because it tells me two things. First, that you come from a smaller firm, so you probably wear a lot of hats, which means you understand your business from many perspectives. That's for sure, I said. And second, the person in your position often finds themselves stymied and is looking to do bigger things. Hmm, bad Pete's and sinister clowns raced through my head. Is that you, he asked, as a man who knows his business and my expectant answer? Yep. Having met you, Park, I think you are the right person for this job. Can you meet their senior VP of marketing, Lynn Harper, this Thursday afternoon? Thursday? Yes, Park, Thursday. I suppose, I said, my head swirling in a heat wave of excitement, fear, and dread. Was I up to this opportunity? Are you ready for this to happen, Park? Uh, yeah. Good, because I think this is going to happen for you. As I was leaving for the interview with Ms. Harper, smartly dressed in my one suit, dark blue with a crisp white shirt, red paisley tie, and snappy red suspenders, I kiss Michelle goodbye. I'll call you before I make any decision about the job, providing they even offer me one, I promised. She wished me luck. Three hours later, Michelle's phone rang. Hello? Hi, honey, it's me, I greeted. How'd it go, she asked. Well, I'm calling you from my new office, I said. 
So much for talking it over, she mused. They wanted an immediate decision and, well, a clown. Crossing the Threshold I was the new director of creative services for Quorum International, a marketer and direct seller of personal electronics and alarm systems. My salary was more than double what I made at Peterson. Plus, I received a monthly bonus on sales, which was nearly as much as my ad agency salary. And I was empowered to create a team of designers, writers, and producers to handle the myriad products Quorum would launch into the worldwide marketplace. For the first time in my career, my personal brand had been clarified to the singular moniker of creative director. I was relieved to have a focused mission, but I underestimated the enormity of the position, which was revealed to me on my first day. Tests, Allies, and Enemies At 10 a.m., I met with a cabal of panic product development managers. They were preparing for an international sales conference and the launch of five new products in just over six weeks. We had no package designs, no creative concepts or marketing materials, and no instructional manuals or launch videos. Bupkis. They looked at me with the optimism that befalls all newcomers, as if I was their savior. But I was the dumbest guy in the room. I knew little about the company or the people around the table, nor did I have an inkling about the new products they were responsible for. I suddenly channeled Sandy Peterson, shut up and listen to their needs. And for some reason, at that moment, a conversation I had had with Michelle's dad popped into my head. Major James Reynolds was a decorated fighter pilot in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. He told me that when a pilot becomes lost in flight, they are instructed to follow the five C's. Climb, conserve, communicate, confess, and comply. Climb to a safe altitude and throttle back to conserve fuel. Communicate with local air traffic control. Confess that you are lost so they understand your situation and comply with their instructions. So I relied on the five C's to make me listen. Instead of joining the conversation completely uninformed, I mentally climbed above the fray. I conserved my energy by simply listening to everyone's wants and needs. I must have sat there for 45 minutes scribbling notes without saying a word. My own assistant, whom I had only known for about two hours, kept shooting me nervous glances to see how I was handling the onslaught. I was amazed at what I learned about the personalities in the room from this vantage point. I understood who had the power in the departments and deciphered their individual agendas, who might be an ally and who might be a foe. Then I finally communicated my thoughts. To my surprise, they listened. My previous silence gave my words gravitas, but I confess that I didn't begin to have all their answers. I was the new guy, somewhat lost at the moment. I told them that I was eager to comply with their wishes, but only after we crafted a creative production plan and a marketing and communication strategy. They agreed. The tension in the room lifted. My heart sank. What have I gotten myself into? I thought. Six weeks later, we somehow launched all the new products to 15,000 boisterous sales professionals. They had gathered from around North America for a two-day sales and marketing conference packing America West Arena in the heart of Phoenix. The direct sales convention was a spectacle of brand storytelling that I had never experienced before. There was a 16-piece orchestra. Quorum's VP of Distributor Relations was dressed in tails and crooned like a Vegas showman. The product launches were grandiose. The sales trainings inspirational. The sales folks were whipped into a fevered pitch. I sat amazed in the second row. This marketing extravaganza turned my branding world upside down. Approach. Quorum was founded by Raymond Hung a Chinese national who amassed his fortune as the owner of an original equipment manufacturer, OEM, called Applied Electronics in Hong Kong. In addition to making Quorum's products, his OEM made parts for brands like Samsung, Sony, and Toshiba. Following the sales conference, Raymond called me into his office to get acquainted. 
He was a formidable character who could be warm but intimidating and not entirely genuine. Raymond was also a devout follower of Feng Shui, the Chinese philosophical system of harmonizing everyone with their surrounding environment. He assessed his people to see if they might attract the good dragon or the bad one, which would affect business positively or negatively. Our offices were under constant renovation as his architect moved walls depending on sales forecasts to allow the good dragon to flow, bolstering the company's prosperity. If sales were down, another wall would be relocated or, like some of my fellow employees, disappear altogether. Believe me, you didn't want to be that guy who attracted the bad dragon. During our conversation, I asked Raymond why he established his global headquarters for Quorum in a remote building near the Deer Valley Airport in North Phoenix, when his family and OEM business were rooted in Hong Kong. Raymond told me that although no one could out-engineer the Chinese, absolutely no one could out-market an American. Raymond then leaned in and lowered his voice. In his broken English, he confided in me, You know, Pak, Quorum is my cup of baby. I grinned at this culturally challenged mixed metaphor. Was Quorum his baby or his cup of tea? It was charming. I realized Raymond was just like me. Despite our different stations in life, we want the same things, health and prosperity. I passed the feng shui test, or so I thought. Central Ordeal In early 1994, Quorum sales experienced a natural slump. The architect and interior designer got back to work moving walls. Raymond sent his cousin Vincent, chief operating officer, into my office with a directive. Vincent told me to get my diastema, the space between my two front teeth, fixed. He said I should close this tooth space because money will fly out of my mouth. That is not good for someone in your position in Raymond's company, Vincent suggested. He got up and left. I sat there and wondered what kind of sign the universe was sending me. By the way, take a look at my current speaker headshot and you'll see how Vincent's directive went over with me. Oh, the stories we homo sapiens tell ourselves. Michelle and I had our third child, a boy named Caden, during this time. He joined our daughter Corbin, the eldest, and our son Parker. Our family was growing, as were my responsibilities at Quorum. But the problem with a high-flying, money-making machine is that it can attract greed. There were a number of changes made in leadership over those first six months of 1994, and I became concerned for the direction of the organization and the credibility of the brand, which directly impacted my job. I voiced my concerns to some in the C-suite, but was told just to keep quiet. One afternoon in October, just over a year into my career at Quorum, I looked up from my desk and my heart skipped a beat. One of those C-suite officers, I'll call him Jerry, stood looking down at me in my office. We had occasionally spoken in the past, sometimes it was a light conversation about our families, but mostly it was about revising aspects of our marketing. These meetings were always on his turf, not mine. So having Jerry looming over me made me wonder if I was about to get fired for insubordination for not fixing that handsome hole in my mouth or for the overuse of said orifice. With his right hand, he placed a small piece of paper on my desk. Park, if we were having this conversation, I'd tell you to call this person, he said, sliding the folded piece of paper toward me. But since we're not, you can do anything you want. He turned and without another word slipped out of my office. I looked down at the insignificant looking note and unfolded it. On the inside was handwritten the name Navaz Gaswala and a local phone number. Given that the numbers weren't arranged in any mnemonic order, as most corporate phone numbers are to help you remember them, I assumed this was a direct line. But a direct line to whom and what? The Arizona autumn sun streamed through the window of my second floor office, warming it like a sauna. I got up and shut my door. I read the name again, Navaz Gaswala. What a mysterious turn of events, I thought. So I dialed. After two rings, she picked up. Hello, this is Navaz, a deep Persian voice intoned. Uh, good afternoon, Navaz. This is Park Howell. Yes, I've been expecting your call, she interrupted. What the?
reward. The Vazgaswala is the right arm to Rex Mon, the owner of Scottsdale-based Forever Living Products International, FLP, the world's largest grower, manufacturer, and distributor of aloe vera-based health and beauty products. In 1994, the company was nearing a billion dollars in annual sales. Despite their growth, they were looking for help with their branding and marketing. Additionally, they recruited me to develop their satellite training network called Forever Vision. Years before the internet, corporations trained their people in classrooms and by mailing manuals and videos. At Quorum, we had created the first KU band satellite network, broadcasting training videos weekly to the homes of our growing network of private direct sales people. We branded it QSN for the Quorum Satellite Network. It was wildly successful for recruiting, motivation, and training. Given that QSN was under my direction, I was the natural go-to guy for FLP who wanted their own satellite network. But I didn't want another job. Thankfully, Navaz and her team weren't interested in hiring another employee. It was a marriage made in the geostationary satellite heavens. Because as I helped FLP launch Forever Vision, FLP helped me launch my ad agency, Park & Co., Jerry from Quorum set in motion this whole chapter in my life. Only later did I realize he was looking out as much for my family as he was for my career when he slid that clandestine note under my nose in my stuffy office. And even later, I learned from the mythology teachings of Joseph Campbell that when you follow your bliss, doors will open where there were only walls. Pay attention to the threshold guardians that open doors for you, just as Bill, Jerry, and Navaz did for me. The Road Back On March 1, 1995, I incorporated Park & Company Marketing Communications, Inc., and for the next 20 years operated as Park & Co., we grew from my solo act working out of our 1930s carriage house in the backyard of our first home to 18 people working in a portion of the 10,600 square foot building we purchased in 2003 in the heart of Phoenix prestigious Arcadia District. We were agency of record for FLP for 18 of those years, and I still work with them today with their international leaders to help them grow their businesses, recruit new distributors, and sell product through the power of story. In addition to FLP in those early days, we added local, regional, national, and international accounts, including Sky Harbor International Airport, Coca-Cola, Kiwit, and Chevron. And during that time span, I never once had a court-appointed process server show up in our driveway on a Sunday morning. Business was good until 2006. Marketing and branding as I knew it wasn't working as it had. The paradigm was shifting. Our ad agency business was easy when brands owned the influence of mass media. All we had to worry about was creating effective advertising for TV, radio, print, outdoor, direct mail, events, promotions, and public relations, and there was no Yelp. But the internet democratized communications. The masses had become the media, and they took control of the bullhorn. Clients started divvying up their accounts. Instead of one agency, they hired specialists to help them understand the new online world. We lost business. Plus, I had not effectively positioned Park & Co. Our agency was essentially a reflection of who I was back in the Peterson Communications days. A jack of all trades, a master of few. We did not have a differentiated offering that made our brand special. We looked like all of our competitors. Our brand story was muddled. Our effectiveness diminished as we struggled to understand the internet. And our journey to survive, let alone thrive, grew increasingly complex and cumbersome. We had become what we feared most, a commodity, a number, number. Then it got worse. Do you recall where you were on September 15th, 2008, the day Lehman Brothers collapsed? which triggered the global recession? I do. We were watching the calamity unfold online at the office. 
It was like reliving 9-11, only the tumbling World Trade Center buildings were metaphorically replaced with the devastating collapse of World Trade Organizations supposedly too big to fail. And this time the terrorists were us, the despicable men and women of Wall Street whose greed destroyed the only thing that will keep a society together, trust. By November, our agency's income was slashed in half as our clients recoiled from the impact of the largest financial crisis since the Great Depression. I did what comes naturally in such a moment. I panicked. It wasn't the full-blown flailing of arms and screaming like a lunatic before blindly running off a cliff into oblivion panic. No, mine was a slower churn of worry that led to the wrong decision of trying to land whatever business we could to keep us afloat. Instead of preserving our resources and directing our energies through a focused brand story to service a niche, we tried to be all things to all people, which of course meant we were nothing to everyone. I should have relied on the five C's, climb, conserve, communicate, confess, and comply. But now it felt like we were auguring in. Resurrection. Then I heard about a guy named Michael Gass. He's an ad agency business development guru. I reached out and expected a brash personality that typically befits a successful biz dev guy, especially in advertising. But what greeted me on our first call was the big southern heart and pragmatic calm of a man from Birmingham, Alabama. Michael had spent nearly 30 years developing new business for ad agencies the old-fashioned way, cold calling and glad handing. But he knew times had changed. He recognized the power of the internet to attract new business long before most agency executives. His recipe was simple. Create a niche-driven blog that positions your agency as a leader in a specific market category, and then promote your wisdom through Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. But to make the gymnastics of this communications floor exercise routine work, you had to first find the courage to have your brand stand for one, and only one thing. He didn't just profess a laser-focused brand position, he modeled it. Michael branded his new consultancy Fuel Lines at FuelingNewBusiness.com with a singular focus that quickly propelled him to the top of page one of Google for the term Ad Agency New Business. Gas still dominates the market category of ad agency new business, helping hundreds of communications firms around the world grow because he clarified his brand story to amplify his impact and simplify his life. He annoyingly stood for one friggin' thing, ad agency new business development online. I say annoyingly because I felt like we were all over the place with our brand. I was among Michael's first five clients in 2008. He flew out to Phoenix to spend the day with me to help refine the Park & Co. brand story. Now I know what you must be thinking. You're a branding specialist. Couldn't you just do this for yourself? The short answer is no. Even Dr. Vo, my dentist, doesn't perform his own root canals. What I've learned is that company leadership is too close to their own business, mired in their operational trenches, blinded by the competitive fog of war, to take a step back and accurately assess their brand position. They worry about becoming too specialized and losing out on ancillary business, when the opposite is actually true. The more you focus, the more you flourish. Furthermore, they tend to talk about what they make, when their brand story is really about what they make happen. They're fixated on features and benefits, but what their audiences, customers, employees, and the communities they serve really want are true stories about honest outcomes. As I experienced with gas, crafting your brand story requires an experienced, impartial outside observer with a proven program to help you see through the opaqueness of your imagined reality. Because, well, some have described their branding experience as something akin to a root canal, a necessary, painful evil. But it doesn't have to be. More about that in a minute. I became embarrassingly aware of my own short-sightedness when Michael took me through his process in our conference room. He asked me to describe our greatest victories as an ad agency. Within these conquests, he said, we had find our passions, our differentiated expertise. I recounted our branding work that created the Water Use It Wisely campaign in 1998. 
It grew to be the largest water conservation effort of its kind in North America, attracting more than 400 private and public entities to the program. After two decades, the campaign is still running today. We reviewed our branding work for Goodwill of Central Arizona, which began in 2003 and grew the organization by more than 400%. We talked about how our success with environmental and social movements attracted advertising work for Resolution Copper, Maricopa County's Clean Air Campaign, and the Expect More Arizona Educational NGO, among others. Michael settled back in his chair and smiled at me. Well, it's obvious, he said. What is, I asked. Your core focus at Park & Co. Huh? I couldn't see what he was seeing. You are Arizona's green marketing agency, he matter-of-factly said. Michael pointed to the successes I was most proud of, which revolved around purpose-driven organizations. Each brand pursued environmental and social cause work. He said we weren't selling products and services, but promoting movements to activate behavior change for the good. And he suggested that our timing couldn't be better because green was becoming a thing. But this was a market segment in its infancy. There were few agencies that owned this brand position. I knew his point was especially true in the conservative state of Arizona. Michael's observation was so obvious that I felt like Bambi with the branding truck barreling down on me. How could I miss this core brand differentiator for Park & Co? Well, I was simply too close to it. Stunned by the high beams of a receding market, caught flat-footed before the accelerating online world, and nearly paralyzed in the intersection where these two market dynamics were colliding. But I sidestepped calamity by clarifying our brand story. Only this was our first challenge. It didn't matter that we dialed in our focus if we couldn't get people to notice it and care. As I mentioned, two years earlier in 2006, I realized the paradigm of advertising as I knew it had shifted. The masses had become the media. The competing cacophony of communication they created seemed impossible to rise above and be heard over. Return with the Boon. As luck would have it, this is when our son Parker became a freshman in the film program at Chapman University in Orange, California. He had always loved making movies. In the third grade, he produced stop action films with Lego men using our antiquated home video camera. He dived into the video program at Arcadia High School, the same school incidentally that Steven Spielberg attended. In his senior year, Parker made a film with his buddy Will Walsh that was featured in the annual Phoenix Film Festival. Now at Chapman, I asked Parker to send me his books when he was done with them. I mean, after all, we were paying for them. I wanted to vet what Chapman taught these impressionable students to prepare them for the most competitive storytelling market in the world, Los Angeles. Plus, I wondered what Hollywood knew that I needed to know to become better at my craft of branding and communications. Parker sent me textbooks, notes from important lectures, videos of compelling guest speakers, and a wealth of online resources to quench my curiosity. His study of the film world took me back to my own coursework at Wazoo. In addition to my communications degree, I also earned a Bachelor of Arts in Music Composition and Theory. I found many similarities between the study of narrative structure and music composition. I was reminded that Mozart's Sonata Allegro form is based on three acts, exposition, development, and resolution. This is when my storytelling mentor appeared, though he'd been dead for nearly 20 years. Joseph Campbell was America's foremost mythologist. He defined a storytelling framework he called the hero's journey, or monomyth as he described in his book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. I've seen the hero's journey detail as everything from a 10-step story structure to a 19-step narrative form. At its core, though, it is a story arc that covers the three acts of setup, problem, and resolution. You will find similar constructs of his three-act structure in many forms. For instance, the humorous author, Kurt Vonnegut, in his The Shape of Stories video on YouTube, describes what he considers the most popular story ever told. Man falls into a hole, man gets out of the hole. Setup, before the hole, problem, falls into the hole, resolution, he gets out of the hole. Dr. Randy Olson, in his book Houston, We Have a Narrative, 
why science needs story, calls it the and, but, and therefore, or ABT. The ABT comprises the same basal three-act story structure based on agreement, contradiction, and consequence. More about the ABT and how you use it to develop your brand story in Chapter 4. A story has a beginning, a middle, and an end, according to Aristotle. It's important at this point in my story to establish in your mind this critical three-act structure because I've learned that storytelling is the most essential teaching device for our survival. We set the stage to create a context for the message we are trying to convey to our audience. Then we inflict conflict, contradiction, or complication to introduce the problem, man in the whole, that our hero, us living vicariously through them, must overcome. Finally, we resolve the situation where we reveal the aha, or teaching moment. I love how Lisa Cron describes how our brains use story in her book, Wired for Story, the writer's guide to using brain science to hook readers from the very first sentence. She noticed that we live vicariously through the heroes and the stories we love so that we can try on their trouble just to see what we would do in case it ever happens to us and we get to experience their problems from the safety of our own easy chair. The hero's journey is the larger story arc based on the classic three-act structure that is filled with plot points, narrative nuances, and assorted scenes that takes you on a journey of imagined reality to reveal a universal truth. Blake Snyder, author of Save the Cat, the last book on screenwriting you'll ever need, who sold more family genre screenplays in Hollywood in the 1980s than any other writer, adapted the hero's journey to what he called the 15 beats of story. Snyder describes the kind of action that needs to take place at every juncture of a 110-page script, right down to the page number. By the way, Snyder was so fixated on story form that he claims a sellable screenplay has to be exactly 110 pages in length. You can remember that number because it's also the ideal weight of a jockey, 110 pounds. (laughs) What a great metaphor he made to make his story point stick. Perhaps the most obvious way for you to see the hero's journey in action is to watch the first Star Wars movie. As the story goes, director George Lucas was a disciple of Campbell's and wrote his senior thesis at USC's film school based on the monomyth template. It became the script to Star Wars, and the rest is pretty much history. Use the illustration of the hero's journey in this book as your guide, and then watch the movie and see Luke Skywalker kick some empire ass. Follow along with the infographic and you'll see the force of the hero's journey play out before your very eyes. Then watch movies like the Indiana Jones series, The Matrix, O Brother Where Art Thou, Ready Player One, any of the Lego movies, or any Pixar flick. They are all based on this timeless narrative framework. Blake Steiner's second book, Save the Cat Goes to the Movies, diagrams his 15 beats, again his version of the hero's journey, in 40 movies. You can rent your favorites, follow along, and experience how the director is taking you by the hand through this epic narrative map. If you're still an unbeliever, watch The Wizard of Oz. You will see Dorothy's trip down the yellow brick road back to Kansas as her hero's journey. But here's the magic. The Wizard of Oz was made in 1939, long before Campbell had identified and revealed the hero's journey structure. Yet it follows it exactly. In fact, this narrative form first appeared in 2100 B.C. in the Epic of Gilgamesh. Greek poet Homer followed the form in his epics, the Iliad and the Odyssey. The hero's journey stands the test of time because it is the primal archetype of narrative framework that is embedded in our unconscious. We humans enjoy these stories because they are mirrors to how we experience life. It's pretty cool, huh? You, me, and everyone are on our own hero's journeys. That's what I realized with my virtual Chapman classes. In 1985, Hollywood story analyst Christopher Vogler wrote a memo to his bosses at Disney titled, A Practical Guide to Joseph Campbell's The Hero with a Thousand Faces. He realized that most of Hollywood's major hits resembled Campbell's monomyth, but in varying ways. Screenwriters innately knew the structure but most weren't intentionally following it when writing their movies. Yet, the big movie hits proved that this story structure worked. 
Vogler figured Disney could produce more hits than the other studios if they became intentional about following the hero's journey with their story development. The memo was leaked, and soon it was the talk of Hollywood. It also prompted Vogler to write The Writer's Journey, Mythic Structure for Writers, which is now in its third edition. His seminal book details how writers can be guided by the hero's journey to craft compelling stories, but he takes it even deeper. Quote, I came looking for the design principle of storytelling, but on the road I found something more, a set of principles for living. I came to believe that the hero's journey is nothing less than a handbook of life, a complete instruction manual in the art of being human. Okay, here's a production note for you. I've actually taken you through the hero's journey in my story. Each one of those section titles was a step in the process. So now I want to continue the primer using The Wizard of Oz, Star Wars, and reflect back on my own story from the beginning of this show. Granted, my tale isn't quite as epic as Dorothy's and Luke's, but it absolutely follows the same primal pattern to narrative, reflecting the fact that story mirrors life. Act 1, Separation, The Ordinary World. You get introduced to the hero in their ordinary world to set the stage for the story and the contrasting world the hero must navigate ahead. Dorothy was a bored farm girl in a monochromatic Kansas before a tornado sweeps her into the colorful world of Oz. Luke Skywalker was a bored farm boy on Tatooine before the murder of his aunt and uncle sweeps him into vanquishing the Empire. I was a bored ad guy toiling in a fallow job in the farmlands of Buckeye, Arizona before a headhunter sweeps me into the new international world of a Chinese-owned electronics direct seller. The Call to Adventure The hero is presented with a problem, a challenge, or an adventure. Dorothy runs away from her aunt and uncle's farmhouse to save her dog Toto from being put down by that nasty neighbor, Miss Almira Gulch which leaves her vulnerable to a coming tornado. In Star Wars, Luke is asked by Obi-Wan Kenobi to join the quest following Princess Leia's holographic visit. My call to adventure was a little pink note on my desk that said a stranger by the name of Bill Frankemont had called. Okay, so it's not a tornado or a holographic appearance by a princess, but it serves the same function in my journey. The mentor, Harold, has arrived. The Refusal of the Call As with all epic adventures that come our way, we're initially reluctant to take that first step because we face the fear of the unknown. A concussed Dorothy upon wakening in Oz is surrounded by munchkins and pushes back on her calling to follow the yellow brick road. In Star Wars, Luke refuses Obi-Wan's call to adventure and returns to his aunt and uncle's farmhouse. Sound familiar? But they've been toasted by the Emperor's stormtroopers. My refusal of the call came when I nearly tossed Bill's message into the trash, and then I was dismissive of my abilities on our first phone call. A shrink might call this self-sabotage to deal with my fear of the unknown. Meeting of the Mentor This is where the Merlin-like character who is the hero's mentor comes in. Dorothy's guide was Glinda, the fairy godmother-like good witch of the North who gifts her the ruby-red slippers and their magical powers. Obi-Wan gives Luke his father's lightsaber and introduces him to the Force. My headhunter mentor, Bill, coaches me on how to present myself for the quorum job and imbues me with the magic of self-confidence when he says, I think this is going to happen for you. Crossing the Threshold You experience the hero fully entering the special world of the story for the first time. We're not in Kansas anymore. Dorothy and Toto set out on the yellow brick road. Luke takes his land speeder with Obi-Wan, R2-D2, and C-3PO to the spaceport town of Mose Eisley, the wretched hive of scum and villainy, according to Obi-Wan. I set foot into the immaculate headquarters of Quorum International, interview with Lynn Harper, and accept the position on the spot. I'm not in Buckeye anymore. Test Allies and Enemies What journey is complete without the allies and enemies you encounter in your new special world? 
Plus, the hero must pass certain tests and challenges for his, her training. Dorothy locks arms with the Cowardly Lion, Tin Man, and Scarecrow, and off they go to be tested by the Wicked Witch of the West. I'll get you, my pretty, and your little dog, too, she screeches. The Mose Eisley Canteen is where Luke forges a crucial alliance with Han Solo and the start of an important enmity with Jabba Dahat. The Quorum boardroom on my first day was where I met my allies and the shadowy sycophants who would sabotage my progress. I was tested immediately with their branding and marketing demands. Approach the Dragon's Den. The journey takes your hero to a dangerous place where the object of the quest is hidden. Dorothy has to confront the Wicked Witch in her own dark castle, replete with creepy flying monkeys. The Empire's tractor beam sucks Luke and his allies into the Death Star where they must rescue Princess Leia. For me, it was the first meeting with Raymond Hum. Although he was a pleasant CEO, I didn't entirely trust him. My Jabba the Hutt? Perhaps. In truth, my innermost cave was more cerebral, dealing with my own uncertainties about the efficacy of my employment and the company, than it was a physical space. That being said, I was painfully aware of the mythical god and bad dragons of Feng Shui, constantly circling about, looking to promote or devour me in the mystical world of Quorum. Okay, now we're through Act 1, or exposition to set the stage. Now we move into Act 2A, called Descent, according to Campbell. With it, we begin with The Ordeal. The hero endures the supreme ordeal. He or she reaches rock bottom, facing possible death. This is the black moment as you, as the audience, stand outside the cave, waiting for the victor to emerge. Dorothy must kill the Wicked Witch and bring her broom to Oz to prove it. In Star Wars, Luke's harrowing moment was in the bowels of the Death Star. He and his valiant crew are trapped in the trash compactor when a serpent drags Luke under the garbage gazpacho, and you're waiting for the bubbles to stop. My supreme ordeal was when Raymond's henchman, Vincent, visits me and strongly suggests that I get oral reconstruction for the good of the Empire, or else. Act 2B, Initiation, begins with seizing the treasure. Your hero survives death bests the dragon, slays the minotaur, and takes possession of the treasure he or she seeks. Dorothy dissolves the Wicked Witch and returns to the Emerald City with her broom. The broom represents a sword of sorts, required for the wizard to return her home. Luke escapes the belly of the Death Star and becomes more worldly for the experience. He levels up to become a pilot for the rebel fleet, what he's always wanted. The absurdity of Vincent's request, combined with the lunacy of a constantly changing leadership team of unqualified, greedy individuals, in my estimation, created a kind of courage in me that set my next chapter into motion. I realized that I had gained the experience, wisdom, and people skills required to venture out on my own, and as the cowardly lion roared, the courage, or so I thought. The Road Back Right when you think your hero is out of the woods, the story turns for the worse. You know the feeling. The universe always punches you in the nose just to see how bad you really want your quest. Dorothy, after all of her travails, unmasks the wizard as a fraud and thinks she'll never make it home. The road back is also captured in chase scenes, as when Luke and friends are escaping the Death Star with Princess Leia and the plans that will bring down Darth Vader. Although I was emboldened to start my own agency, the reality of supporting Michelle and our three kids tested my ambition. Before I could make a decision to leave, a plague of layoffs descended on Quorum. Sales were down and scores of employees were let go. Each department took major hits, including mine. You could feel the despair of job losses slowly encroaching over the company like the shadow of a gleeful bad dragon gliding above. This leads to another dark night of the soul, the darkest before the dawn. 
In my case, the threshold guardian of Jerry arrived, much as Bill Frankemont did earlier in my journey to offer a new call to adventure. Resurrection. The hero emerges from the special world, transformed by his or her experience. Dorothy realizes that all she has to do to return home is to believe she can. She taps her magic slippers together and recites, there's no place like home. Luke repels urges from the dark side and his own self-doubt to blow up the Death Star, frisbeeing Darth Vader into the cold void of space. My resurrection came when, following all my trials at both Peterson Communications and Quorum, I landed Forever Living Products as my first client. As I just wrote that sentence, something struck me. I realized what an apt name Forever Living Products is for the resurrection stage of my career's hero's journey. <laughs> ah, the universe. Act 3, Return with the Boon. Your hero returns to their ordinary world, but not empty-handed. He or she brings back the elixir, treasure, or some lesson from their experience in the special world. Dorothy returned to Kansas with the appreciation that there is no place like home, and we all have it within us to center ourselves on what is truly important. Luke has vanquished the Empire, at least for now, and metaphorically we learn that a positive force will overcome a negative one. I return from nearly becoming a corporate drone in a high-flying international company to the independence of running my own ad agency. My elixir was the experience, knowledge, and courage I gained by working in a fast-paced global organization that created its own mythology. My ad agency, which I ran for 20 years launched in 1995. I'm a believer. The monomyth has become my storytelling religion. I'm Bilbo Baggins and the hero's journey is the irresistible mystical ring, but with a more positive motivation. I was drawn to the special world of Hollywood out of desperation because branding and advertising as I knew it stopped working in my ordinary world. I felt that this primal story structure was waiting for me. Once I found the hero's journey, I recognized it for what it is, a time-tested treasure map for communicators. And here's the best part. While the mile markers for each step of the hero's journey remain relatively the same, the formula can be crafted in innumerable ways, limited only by the imagination of the storyteller. Vogler underscores this in the writer's journey, quote, I'm retelling the hero myth in my own way, and you should feel free to do the same. Every storyteller bends the mythic pattern to his or her own purpose or the needs of a particular culture." End quote. This is when I decided to map the hero's journey to branding and business. I used the core story elements, but removed the more nuanced steps that work in movies. They're not needed in brand strategy. The following diagram shows you its evolution from Campbell to Vogler to the story cycle system. You can find the diagram in the show notes. The boon of the story cycle system. Okay, if your head is spinning, no worries. Campbell's 19-step outline struck me that way too. I felt like a greenhorn cop picking through Sherlock Holmes' cerebral forensic files to solve a case. That's why I prefer Vogler's simpler 12-step journey. It outlines the 12 story elements we all are used to seeing in the movies we love. Even though you may have not known of the hero's journey until now, your subconscious sure did. Does it somehow seem familiar to you? I've simplified the journey even more in the story cycle system. I mapped the 10 invaluable steps exactly to branding and business communications, while still holding true to the core anchors that make every story work. Let me do the math for you. This is how you use the story cycle system inspired by the hero's journey to craft your brand narrative. Act 1. Setup. Backstory. This is your position statement. Set the stage for your brand story by first defining your number one position in the market. What do you do differently and more distinctively and therefore better than anyone else? This helps you focus your brand offering for deliberate growth. Step 2. Heroes. Identifying your target audiences. Despite popular belief, you and your brand are not the hero of this journey. Your customers are. 
So as you're crafting your brand story strategy, prioritize your top three audiences and place them at the center of your brand story to understand your customers for faster growth. By the way, this is a good time to tell you that I use the terms customers and audiences interchangeably because I feel that whenever you're telling a story, you're trying to sell something to someone, a product, service, internal initiative, financing of your operation, or a promotion. Step three, stakes, your customers' wishes and wants. Determine what your customers want physically and philosophically so you connect with your audiences on their terms for greater growth. I think of their motivations captured in these three areas. What do they wish to feel emotionally? What do they want physically to have to make that happen? And what is their will to act to make that happen? Because make no mistake, brands are in the wish-granting business. Now that we've set the stage for your brand narrative in Act 1, let's move into Act 2. This begins in Step 4 of the story cycle system called Disruption. Here, you'll craft your unique value proposition that articulates why you are the most timely, urgent, and relevant offering in your market. Get this right, and your brand story will help you become the clear category leader to accelerate your growth. Step five, antagonists. These are the market dynamics. Pinpoint the negative market dynamics that test the performance and delivery of your offering. By getting clear on how you help your customers overcome something to get what they want, you increase your importance in their hearts and minds to advance your growth. Step six, mentor. Your brand personality. Since stories make us human, doesn't it make sense to use storytelling to humanize your brand? Get out of your logical head and own your brand's emotional promise, spiritual gift, and unique personality to create deeper meaning with your customers. This is the first step to building a lasting brand bond with your audiences for accountable growth. Step seven, journey. This is customer engagement. Map the journey your customers will undertake with you from brand awareness to adoption to appreciation. This will help you understand their journey empathize with their wishes and wants, and captivate your audiences to amplify your growth. Act 3, Resolution, the final three steps of the story cycle system, beginning with victory. Plan your customers' success milestones and how you'll be there for them. Celebrate even their smallest victories to propel your brand story forward and sustain your growth. Step 9, The Moral, Connecting to a Higher Purpose. Declare your brand purpose, why you exist beyond making money. When you and your purpose-driven brand stand for something greater, you will amplify your impact through meaningful growth. And finally, step 10 of the story cycle system is ritual, or creating repeat business and word-of-mouth marketing. Design ways for your audience to ritualize the use of your product or service to build repeat business. Plus, this is the point when you'll encourage your customers to share their experiences and your story with their communities. In doing so, you will simplify your sales through word-of-mouth marketing to compound your growth. Now you have witnessed how the story cycle system came to life in my life. I hope you will use my journey in storytelling to help you on yours, because what I've learned along the way is that my calling is to help you excel through the stories you tell. And by all means, never let that clown that represents your insecurities squirt you in the eye from its fake boutonniere. You're the ringleader of your own circus, so own it. That's it, the final segment from my book, Brand Bewitchery. If you enjoyed my origin story and learned how you can use the hero's journey-inspired story cycle system for your storytelling, then please, by all means, share this episode with someone you know who will benefit by becoming a more confident and persuasive storyteller. If I can help you and your team excel through the stories you tell, then hit me up at Park at Business of Story. I'll be happy to give you information on my in-person trainings, virtual and hybrid mastery courses, keynotes, and even my do-it-yourself storytelling program. 
Our music here is composed by Darius Holbert, marketing by Marissa Hill, and the show is edited by Caden Howell. I hope you'll join us next week when Joey Coleman, author of Never Lose an Employee Again, will join us to share how compelling storytelling is at the heart of every successful company. So until then, remember that the most potent story you will ever tell is the story you tell yourself. So make that one epic. Thanks so much for listening.